I wouldn't blame your being a content creator as a big element to your gripes with Tears of the Kingdom too much because a lot of us feel the same way. In fact, it's really refreshing to hear you have these conflicting feelings about the game because I've been curious for a while now how the content creators feel about it. I would still love to hear more of your thoughts in a more focused video. You are definitely not alone, Bandit. I would gladly welcome a complete outpouring of your honest thoughts and conclusions I would love on a video where you just like rant about the game. Out, I feel like I was the only person who was really sorry, Bandit, but we're going to need a full analysis on this. I totally agree with all your points. Don't hold back. We are counting on you to tell us what you have said about my thoughts. We're so glad to rant. 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 We're so our video would be amazing. All right, fine. But for warning, I do get a little rambly when talking about exactly how I feel about games, particularly Zelda games. So what I'm going to do is I'm just going to play a little bit of the beloved game that we're talking about while I'm telling you exactly how I feel. And we'll see how this goes. I'm just going to keep the camera rolling. So if you had seen my video that I had released a little bit ago called The Zelda Rant, um, then you probably already know my feelings about the game, at least my feelings in general. But in case you haven't, allow me to briefly summarize. I think that it's a very fun game to play, gameplay-wise. Running around, killing enemies, you know. It's fun in the same ways that Breath of the Wild was fun. Uh, partially, actually mostly, because it's the same freaking world and engine and enemies and setup and goals and pretty much everything from Breath of the Wild. And that was already a fun formula, so this game is fun in the same ways, just, you know, with the added uh, new Ultra Hand and things like that. Um, but it is a bit lacking. And by a bit lacking, I mean quite a bit lacking in certain other ways. Some ways that a lot of people fault me for because, you know, I'm just being a crying baby nerd with a lot of expectations, which is fair, which is fair. But other ways which are rather fair, I feel, across the board. Ways like this right here. Now I'm going to, I, I'm actually going to start this video off by talking about the positive things, believe it or not. But this is still in my intro segment, so I'm going to get this one out for free, okay? For those of you who have played Breath of the Wild, you'll probably recognize pretty much everywhere, or at least 90% of what you're going to be exploring in Tears of the Kingdom, because 90% of it is going to still be in the very familiar world of Hyrule. The surface, whatever you want to call it in Tears of the Kingdom. And as you'll probably remember, places like this are where Cass is, for instance. Standing here, and being... Well, being Cass and having like a unique quest line for you. I forget what it is in Breath of the Wild when he's standing here, but it's like a hero's treasure thing. He's got a song. Anyway, clearly this entire area right here was built around that. Now in Tears of the Kingdom, this is a recycled area. Cass is no longer here. In fact, Cass is... who knows where Cass is. But Cass is no longer here, and all we really get for retreading old ground is a Korok. Anyway, but that was just for free, alright? That was for free, just because I happened to log into my game standing here. I'm actually going to start out talking about all of the positive things about the game, of which there are many. And I have a little outline over here to at least keep myself at least somewhat aligned with what I'm trying to say. So, starting out with the good things. How it felt to play in the sky. That's what I have written down, number one. This right here. Just this. This is what feels like a new game. This is what feels like Tears of the Kingdom. And this is what is a ridiculous amount of fun. Oops, I'm about to fall off while I'm talking here. Every island that you see off in the distance, there's no secret sauce for. There's no, there's no, like you see all those islands all the way off over there, or maybe that one, or maybe there's, of course, I don't think there's anything above my head as far as another island is concerned right now, but that one like right way over there. Like how, how am I supposed to get over to that island, right? You might ask yourself, there is no secret sauce. You just learn the game and the mechanics that the game has brought to the table and you figure it out for yourself. You use your new abilities to build ridiculous vehicles or whatever and, and make it there on your own. And that is phenomenal. It took the exploration of Breath of the Wild. Whoopsie. I don't know if I've gotten this Korok here. Have I gotten this? Oh, I have. Okay. It took the exploration of Breath of the Wild and just multiplied it by having you not have ground in between where you're trying to get. 
Because on the surface of Hyrule, as complicated as it gets is just trying to climb up like a mountain or something and not having enough stamina, or maybe it starts raining and then you fall down and you can't get to where you were trying to go. That's as complex as it gets for exploration down in the world of Hyrule. In this game, there's nothing connecting us. Not only do I have to figure out probably where to, how to climb up that island when I get there or, you know, whatever, but I've got to figure out how to get over there first. And that's brilliant. Tears of the Kingdom's concept is a phenomenal one as far as just a damn fun to play game is concerned. And of course, one of the biggest changes, if not the biggest change, to Tears of the Kingdom from Breath of the Wild would be the addition of Ultra Hand and the removal of all of the other abilities that we had in Breath of the Wild. I don't think I have to waste video time explaining to you why Ultra Hand is so fun to use. All the reasons that you're thinking of in your head, all the things you've created, the unholy aberrations, the unholy s creations that you people watching have created in this game with Ultra Hand, and the unholy creations that I've created are all worth it. What more is there to be said about Ultra Hand? And the other thing that was a, a positive and a negative for this game, but we'll get into that later, but the other thing that I really liked about this game was the, the combat. And by the combat, which was exactly the same as Breath of the Wild, I mean the weapons. All the different kinds of arrows have evaporated into thin air, and now what you do is you fuse them with whatever you would like to shoot. And if you want an elemental arrow, that means you fuse them with an elemental piece of equipment or gear or whatever. And that's cool, because now you can do a lot more with that. Now you can have weapons that have base uh, uh, buffs. Like for instance, a, a Zora Spear will always have the buff called Water Warrior, which means that if it gets wet, you see now, you see how it's at 66 damage there with its infusion? Now if it gets wet, it is at 132. And that's really cool. The ability to just, I mean, <laughs> their ridiculous appearances aside, like, you know, this freaking fire heart on the end of a really crappy looking sword, their ridiculous appearances aside, it's a really cool concept. I like the ability to craft my own weapons. That's the end of the good things that I wrote down. So. And I have here written down, anything else, question mark? Before I get into my complaints about the game. There were a couple pieces of new music. A few. Some of which are even memorable. So that's cool. The Colgara theme's pretty cool. Obviously, the story continuing from Breath of the Wild and giving us new interactions with the characters that we grew to love from Breath of the Wild like Sidon and Riju uh, and Unibo, those are really cool. I liked that. I liked some of the story additions. I'm really thinking, you guys. I'm really thinking. I'm trying. I'm trying. Oh, of course, the, the new areas, right? So it is cool to have... <sighs> I get sad every time I see just how much empty space there is up here. But anyway, I get... You know, it is really cool to have new places to go, even though it is largely 90% the same world. It's it's cool to have new places to go, and even though the depths is the same in every corner, if you've been to the depths here, you've been to the depths here. If you've been to the depths here, you've been to the depths here. If you've been to the depths here, you've been to the depths here. You get my point. But it is cool to have just a lot more space to just run around, if, if, any, if nothing else, right? So that's very cool. But before I actually go into my harsher criticisms about it. Let's just talk about the other powers that we've got real quick. So Fuse was always an odd addition to me because Fuse is essentially just Ultra Hand. It's the same concept. They just they just dedicated it to its own power for some reason. Because see, Ultra Hand already sticks things together in infinitely, right? And Fuse sticks things together and fuses them into the same item or weapon or whatever. It seems to me that that should have just been a feature of Ultra Hand. Like, Fuse should have just been like a sub-feature of Ultra Hand. Like, I don't see why, you know, this option that you get with Fuse right here could not also pop up if you're targeting it with Ultra Hand. It's not like it's taking up different buttons. With those two powers just being extremely similar, I almost feel like they ran out of ideas for powers to give Link. And Auto Build is just... Ultra Hand that saves you time. 
But again, it almost seems like that should have just been a subcategory of Ultra Hand. I, I think that they should have had bombs make a return as an ability. Both square and circle. I mean, that would have taken up this slot and that slot right there. Because square bombs were like the greatest invention in Breath of the Wild. That they, they, they were. Okay, bombs that would sit where you put them. I mean, mind-blowing, right? I think that was one of the most mind-blowing things about Breath of the Wild, actually. Now, if you want to blow something up, you've got to have bomb flowers. That's pretty much it. Either that or you've got to make some sort of chemical reaction that I can't think of off the top of my head. And I know a lot of people are going to talk about the time bombs because these are technically the replacements to the bombs. But look at how large and unwieldy these things are. You know, who? Th these are not the... These are not fair replacements to the bombs that we had, and we also can't make them explode on command anymore. They have to be timed. Like that. It doesn't matter if I shoot it again, it's going to blow up when it's going to blow up. So, the removal of the bombs from Breath of the Wild is a very strange feeling, but I, I honestly, I think they might have removed them, because clearly they had a focus on removing all of the, you know, like glitches and things that people would exploit about the Breath of the Wild engine. Like for instance, whistle running, which you cannot do anymore. People would exploit that in Breath of the Wild. The bomb jumping, people would exploit that in Breath of the Wild. So I think that, I think that they removed those probably directly to combat those exploits for movement that people would, uh, I mean, everybody used them. I used them. But anyway, I will summarize this little bonus segment of talking about Link's abilities by saying, I like this one. I really like this one. I surprisingly really, really like this one. These two should have been part of this, and we should have had our bombs back. Honestly, like, energy-based bombs that you can decide when they blow up, one of which is a, a cube, should be a staple of the Zelda series, and that is a hill that I will die on. They should reappear in the next game, and that is a hill that I will die on. Okay, with all of that aside, as the sun is setting... Thematically, it is also setting on the positive things about the game. And you might be wondering, Bandit, you were being positive this whole time? Yes. Yes, I was. So let's get into it. Speaking of the Sky Islands, which we are standing on, we are standing on pra perhaps the most unique one of them all. You remember how just a few minutes ago I pulled up this map and I, I took a look at it and I was like, oh wow, look at all that empty space. Yeah. Yeah, look at all that empty space. When, when I first started playing this game, I was, oh boy, I was, oh boy, I was excited. I mean, everybody was, right? And this is where you start. Spoiler alert, sorry if you didn't know that. I don't know why you're still watching this if you didn't know that, but this is where you start. And it kind of teaches you how to play the game, the same as the Great Plateau in Breath of the Wild. And then you make your first descent down to Hyrule. And you, you, excuse me, you ascend your first sky view tower. You go up in the sky and you get your first piece of the map and it's empty. It's all empty except for that island you were already on, but you think to yourself, okay, that's fine. There are other places in the sky that are going to be much more cluttered, I'm sure. Much more densely packed with, with sky islands and content in the air, I'm sure. And little by little, every time that you go up a tower, or at least this was my experience, every time you see something like this, just two or three, and that's it. And your, your, your heart begins to sink, little by little. And not only are there really not that many Sky Islands in the game, where there should have been, like, it should have been mostly new Sky Islands in Tears of the Kingdom, because that's what really feels like a new game and that's what's really fun. Not only are there, pra like, basically not any, but a lot of them are just copy and paste. This island right here, this little quadrant thing, with the little quadrants. Okay, that's one of the only unique ones there, because it also has a temple to deal with. Oh look, there's the quadrants. Oh look, there's a quadrant. Oh look, there's a piece of the quadrant. Oh look, there's another quadrant. 
Oh wow, look, is that is that what is that? A quadrant? Another quadrant? Wow. Oh look, there's more quadrants. Like in every single corner of the map, there are copy and paste islands and there are copy and paste like platform islands. There are even a couple copy and paste globes. Oh, and even the the flying the flying labyrinths. They literally just took and and I don't know if you can see like like just blink back and forth, but these flying labyrinths, which are just flying for no freaking reason, and which are just, they, they are duplicates. Like, literally, you pull up this labyrinth object file in something like Blender 3D, and just control C, and control D. I'm sorry, I forget how to duplicate in Blender, it's been a couple years now. But you just duplicate the entire model, and put it in the sky, and that's what they did. With these, and, they're, and then they were like, you know what, that's cool, that's content. This is content, this is content that people are, are asking for in Tears of the Kingdom, absolutely. And there are a few unique islands in the sky. There's the Great Sky Island. There's the two temples, there are the two temples up here and their associated islands. There are... The, bra the bravery and courage and, you know, those islands where you you fall down even though they're all really similar to each other with this oh, whoopsie with the same concepts um, but there are those and then of course there is the thunderhead isles which again leads to a temple so there are the three temple leading isle islands the great sky island the quadrants the spheres the copy paste labyrinths and the falling islands and honestly i think i've just summed up oh and the copy paste platform islands and honestly, I think I've just summed up all there is new in the sky. Now, I'm I'm not trying to, like, stomp my feet on the ground and bang my fists on, on the desk and just be an absolute child about things and just complain because I wanted more, blah, blah, blah. But I, I am going to do that a little bit, actually. <laughs> because, listen, this was a $70 game. Okay, this this was a $70, this was a new experience that was being sold to us. You want to know what they did in their last $70 game, or $60 game, or whatever? All of that. All of that. Okay, and you cannot tell me that they ran out of ideas for Sky Islands when they created all of this. Do you, do you want, like, just recall with me back in Breath of the Wild, or even this game if you want, how every single, like, in this segment right here, there are probably like five secrets. In this segment right here, there's probably 12. In this entire quadrant of the map, there's probably a hundred, 200. That's probably not even scratching the surface. I don't know how I died there, but anyway, that's probably not even scratching the surface. The creativity that we were expected, uh, that, that we had gotten used to from Breath of the Wild, was astounding, staggering. I mean, it won Game of the Year easily because it was so big and complex and, and intricately detailed. And then in Tears of the Kingdom, like I keep mentioning, the actual new content that everybody was excited for was that we were going to the sky. Nobody really cared about re- like, yes, we were okay with revisiting the same world of Hyrule, sure, because it's a big- wide open world and a lot of us felt like they could have done a lot more with it because really the whole world of Hyrule and Breath of the Wild was sparsely populated but only with like one of two things a shrine or a Korok seed basically basically there were a few other things but basically that was the overwhelming like that was their content that they filled the place up with and so we were we were okay with a return to Hyrule given that it would bring more to the table. More unique bosses around the place, more unique items around the place, the return of dungeons maybe. There were several different reasons why we were excited to return to Hyrule, but one of the biggest things was that we were excited to go to the sky. And this is what we got. I don't know how to, like I'm not going to sit here and calculate, but I would be willing to bet just looking at this and looking at this, that the total surface area of new actual new content in Tears of the Kingdom actual new land surface area content would be probably less than 10% probably 
probably just 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 eyeballing this right here probably of an absolute maximum of 10 percent of the the land volume that we were used to in breath of the wild and i know what you're thinking but bandit look at that that's an entire other map underneath hyrule and it's just as big as hyrule well like i was saying earlier in the video <clears throat> I, I admire Nintendo for keeping the depths a secret for as long as they did. Like, I really, really admire Nintendo for, for like, nobody thought, even a little bit, that there was going to be another entire world down, down, down under. And they hit it. They hit it really well. And boom. Everybody was subs uh, subscribed. Wow. Everybody should be subscribed watching this. But no, everybody was surprised when this happened. And, and when we first would fall down in the chasms and fought giant frog monsters and whatever, like, that's a beautiful thing. I'm not gonna lie. The depths, they could have done so much more with. So much more. And I'm gonna go into this a little bit more, a little bit, just, just here in a second. But, excuse me, there aren't even tough enemies down here. Like, there, at the end of the game, you're still gonna be running into, like, red bacoblins down here. Truly, ultimately... Even though we have these sky islands and the depths, 90% of the game still takes place right here in the same Hyrule. And like I was just saying, we were okay with that. We were excited about that even, because there were a lot of new things that they could have done with this Hyrule. But here's what they did. The towers are back, just different, in roughly the same locations, but not quite. Shrines are back. In fact, there are more of them to do. And Korok Seeds are back. In fact, there are more of them to do. Literally, quite literally, the same stuff from Breath of the Wild. They just brought back. Just a little bit differently. Of course, the shrines are... I'll be honest, I... <clears throat> They had some really fun puzzles in Shrines in Breath of the Wild. And they have really fun puzzles in Shrines in Tears of the Kingdom. And if I were to... If I were to say which ones I preferred, I'd probably say the ones in Tears of the Kingdom. Because Tears of the Kingdom's sandbox with Ultra Hand is a lot more open. You can just, you know, you, you can, it, it's, it's truly open. You can combine anything to anything and really exploit the physics system. Um, so I, I liked the shrines in this game as far as shrines are concerned. But I would have traded half of these shrines for, I don't know, anything else. One of the other things they did do is they added a whole bunch of caves. But 90% of the same of, of the area that you'll be traversing in this game is the same Hyrule, and 90% of what you're going to be doing in the same Hyrule is the same stuff. Going to a tower, solving a shrine. So that was also kind of a letdown. Oh, you know, not to kind of flip-flop back and forth, but one of the other things that I forgot to mention that was a positive about this game would be some of the new enemies that they brought into it. I really liked, and notice I said some because they aren't all new enemies. Most, the vast majority of the enemies are still the copy-paste enemies from Breath of the Wild. But the Phantom Ganons, hello, those are cool as hell. I, like, I really, really, really enjoy uh, fighting those, those scary hands. The Froxes were a welcome addition, and the Gleox, of course, were a welcome addition. In fact, you know what? Speaking of Gleox, I'm just gonna go over there and kill the one that's on the bridge. Why not? But I've got pretty much nothing bad to say about any of the added enemies. Um, the bosses that were new for the dungeons. I like them about as much as I liked the... I mean, I liked that they were at least their own species and their own monsters. Um... But, I mean, I, I liked them about as much as you would like, you know, the, the different Blight Ganons from Breath of the Wild. Which, by the way, used to- are, are also Phantom Ganons. And I know that I previously was praising the combat, kind of, for giving you a lot more customizability. I mean, look at this. I have a flower shield. Like, yeah, you guys, I have a freaking- I have a flower shield. Do you have a flower shield? I didn't think so. Unless you do. But mine's cooler, obviously, because it's my flower shield. And I love my flower shield. I wouldn't trade my flower shield for the world. Of course, I can't do stuff like this with my flower shield. Oh, I can. I actually had no idea that I could shield surf with my flower shield, because typically you can't when you fuse something on there. But either way, I like my flower shield. It's cool. 
the ability to fuse things is cool. But here's the other aspect to that. You know how in Breath of the Wild everybody was complaining about, oh, weapons breaking? Like, everybody was complaining about weapons breaking. Even people who defended that mechanic admitted that it was kind of a, you know, a, oh, why is my thing blinking? Stop telling me where ore deposits are. Yeah, turn off. But like I was saying, even people who defended this mechanic still thought... You know, I just realized that I'm trying to multitask this and I'm probably going to suck at multitasking. But here, you guys are going to see the the greatest way to kill a Gliok. And you're going to be so impressed. Seriously though, why are you so mad? What did I ever do to you? I sometimes try to see if I can hit two of the heads in one go, but that never really works out for me. Where are you going? Here, take one of these with you! Oh, you're too far up. Oh, what's he doing? What are you doing? Oh. Well, that's big. I forgot how big that is. It's been, it's been a while since I've killed one of these. Oh, I'm sorry, did you die? I didn't notice you were still alive. But anyway, it didn't happen in this fight. I was kind of hoping that it would happen just so I could complain about it a little bit. But, when, when your weapons, you, cause, okay, so here's the thing. A lot of people were hopeful that with the addition of fusion on your weapons and the ability to do stuff like this, destroy your fuse material, a lot of people were hopeful that you could repair your weapons and keep your weapons and stop them from from breaking so often and having to say goodbye to your good weapons and therefore promote, you know, a healthier use of your weapons rather than trying to only use your weakest ones pretty much all the time and trying to save your your big ones pretty much all the time and never really using them. But that's not the case. Your weapons will still break all the same in Tears of the Kingdom. It's just that not only is your weapon still breaking, you also fused something to it. And here's why that kind of sucks. Because not only are you breaking one weapon now, you're breaking one weapon and one material. And a lot of these materials you also need for your gear upgrades. So you're having to spend not just weapons now, but you're basically it's a double whammy now with weapons. So not only do you, yes, you do get to craft custom weapons and that's really cool, but the toll is much higher now. Because now you're burning through your materials and weapons. Like, I'd be okay if, if when you fuse it, the material on the end would break, and you could, you could keep the base weapon. That would make a lot more sense to me, but that's just not the case. Everything breaks. And the Master Sword being able to, like, fuse whatever onto it, and, like, it, it looks really cool with the runes, but, you know, kind of transforming into and taking the characteristics of whatever you fused onto it is, is a strange touch, but it's pretty cool, though. It makes sense, because in that way, like, if I were to have fused, you know, a blunt, like a mace thing onto the Master Sword, not only does he swing it like a mace instead of like a blade, but it can also mine much easier. Etc. Etc. So the fusion system for weapons is a good thing and a bad thing, like I was saying. Oh yeah, and the like, like, like the return of the like likes was pretty cool too. I'm not gonna lie. But again, if you've been in one cave, you've been in them all. So it's kind of they kind of did the same thing that they did with all of the world and level design in Breath of the Wild in uh, with caves in Tears of the Kingdom. That is to say, is that warm enough? Okay, cool. That's warm enough. That is to say, they brought a new concept in the caves, which is cool. It's a cool concept in and of itself. Can I go down here? Yes, I can. It's a cool concept in and of itself, but they didn't do that much with it. If you've been in one cave, really, you've been in them all. Now, the depths, on the other hand, like I said, this was a very, very welcome addition to the formula of Breath of the Wild that nobody was complaining about. And I'm, I'm, I'm like 90% sure that they were inspired by uh, Elden Ring. Uh, because if you'll recall, one of the delays was announced shortly after Elden Ring came out. And Elden Ring has this phenomenal moment in it. I don't know if any of y'all have played it. But if you've been on my channel for long, you know that I am a huge fan of Elden Ring. We'll be covering it when the DLC uh, drops. Um, I've covered it before on the channel. Um, but Elden Ring is a beautiful, beautiful game that I have... Like, nothing bad to say about, really. 
and it has a beautiful moment in it where you go down this this elevator in a well and you're like oh what little chasm or or catacombs is this going to lead to and it just keeps going down and keeps going down and then everything in front of you opens up and you see a new starry sky which is really like just the roof of the ca of the caverns but it looks like stars because it's all sparkly and it's it's a whole other world down there a whole other world and it just opens up and then like that the text on the screen pops up you know and it's like uh co for a river or or i forget you know what what the area is called but anyway it's a beautiful moment and i'm pretty sure that nintendo was inspired by that with the concept of the depths now again just like i said with the wells the depths were a new concept that they brought up but didn't do all that much with and just like the wells if you've been in one part of the depths you've been in all of them because there's always a mine nearby that has zonite. And there are always zonite ore deposits around that have some really, really, really ridiculously weak enemies guarding it. And that's about it. I mean, there are a few unique kind of quests to do down here. Don't get me wrong, the design of the depths is cool. <clears throat> but one of the things that they did decide to do with the depths that I am cross with them about and will likely not forgive pretty much ever would be in every single mine there's a chest and inside this chest is either 100 zonai charges which you will use to upgrade your zonai batteries or get this a dlc or amiibo item from breath of the wild just stuck in a chest down here. Fans of Breath of the Wild who picked this game up, which is the vast majority of people. I mean, that's why this game sold 10 million copies in the first three days. It's just an insane, insane turnout. Is because everybody from, from Breath of the Wild was really waiting and nipping at the butt to play this game. When that's the only reward for traversing every corner of the deep, deep dark depths, the only reward that you get is a chest that has the tunic of the sky in it, or whatever, or the Majora's Mask in it. Like, that's a cool little Easter egg, same as it was in Breath of the Wild, sure. Cool to wear around and kind of show off, sure. But, there's no, it doesn't inspire a drive in you to go and figure out what's in each chest. It's the same stuff from Breath of the Wild, and, and speaking of the same stuff carried over from Breath of the Wild, practically everything is. Now, they did give us from here downwards some new gear but again that stops right here and it goes right back to all of the same gear from breath of the wild and then of course the ancient heroes aspect i read a lot of comments online asking people why they're upset that a lot of the armor sets and music and enemies and gear and and weapons are reappearing from breath of the wild they get upset and they say it's a sequel what did you expect when have you ever seen a sequel to debut with 90% the same gear. But I'm I'm going to I'm going to stop talking about I'm going to stop talking about gameplay stuff now. Because that's going to be that's debatable. I mean, all of this is debatable. This is all just my opinion. And it's I can't believe I've been recording for nearly an hour now and it's taken me this long to say, "Hey, this is just my opinion." Really honestly, I shouldn't have to say that, but you know, it's the way the internet is these days. A lot of people, a lot of you watching, will respect this as my opinion, as you should. And, you know, even if you disagree. But there are some of you watching this right now who are just very, very, very upset that my opinion differs from yours. And all I'm saying is just, just understand that if you disagree and you feel differently and you loved everything that I said that I didn't love or will be saying that I didn't love, that's fine. I'm telling you right now that's fine. You can still be my friend and I can still be yours. Take this thumbs up as proof of that, of my friendship. Because this isn't something that fandoms should divide over. I'm just, But I'm just letting you know how I feel. Because I also have read a lot of comments saying that the internet is a very lonely place if you don't find people who agree with you. And honestly, I agree. So that's why I'm doing this. For you guys to find solace in my opinion, and for me to find solace for my opinion in you guys. So really honestly... I'm, I'm done talking about gameplay right now because what's more important than the new 
the amount of Sky Islands, the shape of the Sky Islands, the... the... Oh yeah, this was a cool addition. Man, I, I wish they had done more with, like, giving Link powers in this game, because this was actually really, really cool. Being able to do what Sheikah... Or, I'm sorry, Giga people do. But anyway, what's more important than any of this to me is the story. And damn it, that's what they let me down with the most in this game. So let me start out by saying that Tears of the Kingdom started off extremely strongly. It started off with a bang. This cutscene right here was everything. It was perfect. Finding Ganondorf, everything was so mysterious. But he's going to say something here in just a second that I'm going to really zero in on. And I want you guys to pay attention to because it was so... Mm, just chef's kiss and it could have been so much more than it ended up being. So this right here is the first thing that was extremely intriguing to me. The fact that something could shatter the Master Sword. This blade can stand up against the Triforce, by the way. It can kill a Triforce-blessed individual. In Twilight Princess, it's shown to be able to do that. My power cannot save you from me. And that's the thing, like, I agree. So what's his power, right? What's this new grand power? You carries that fragile sword. This is what I was talking about. This is what I was talking about. Can I pause this? No, I can't. Okay, so I'm just going to back out of this because it goes on for quite a while longer. But that right there, when Ganondorf says Zelda and you who carries that sword are Link. Listen, none of us knew that this was going to be a closed time loop story by the time when we were just playing this, okay? we So when Ganondorf looked at Zelda and Link and recognized them, do you know how insanely cool that felt? Because for the first time, it felt like he recognized them because it was the same Ganondorf from earlier in the franchise. For those of you who are new to the franchise, from Breath of the Wild, Ganondorf has been a big baddie since the days of Ocarina of Time. Technically, technically since A Link to the Past. Because that's when we had figured out that Ganon used to be a, a man known as Ganondorf Dragmire, if you were to have read the A Link to the Past manual that came with the game. And then in Ocarina of Time in 1998, the big bad dude actually came out swinging. And man, he, he has left a lasting impact on the gaming world ever since his first appearance. Wind Waker came out and his appearance just got cooler. It was the same Ganondorf, but we're fighting him untold years later. The original world of Hyrule has been swallowed underneath the waves and he's back. He's going to resurrect the old world because he always wanted it for his people you know so his story got deep we love Ganondorf and then he died at the end of that game and in the end of that timeline and in the child timeline of course he had an appearance in Twilight Princess a little bit less to say about him in that game but still a cool appearance and then we said goodbye to him for 17 years and now he's back and he's been slumbering and creating Ganon's this whole time right so a lot of us were thinking oh this is this is him from the Fallen timeline. He's been here the whole time. He recognizes Link and Zelda from Ocarina of Time. Or from A Link to the Past. Uh, or, or from, you know, A Link Between Worlds or, or whatever. Like, he, he recognizes them. Oh my goodness. Or, or, you know, it felt so cool to have Ganondorf, of all people, directly talk about the timeline in a Zelda game. But of course, we know that that wasn't the case. He only knew who Zelda was because Zelda got sent back in time, removed from the situation immediately, exactly like Breath of the Wild. And he knew Link's name because Raru practically whispered it in his ear before he sealed him away for countless millennia, or however long it was, excuse me. Which is significantly, significantly, significantly less impactful. And speaking of Ganondorf's impact, there wasn't any. I was just talking about how deep of a character Ganondorf has been this whole time, and some of y'all might not have even known that. Some of y'all might have thought that Ganondorf was just a stereotypical video game baddie this whole time. But for a lot of people, you know, or at least the ones who, who like to read in between the lines and whatever, Ganondorf is, is deeper than just that. And really, honestly, we have his Wind Waker appearance to thank for that. We also have his Ocarina of Time appearance, because the first time he saw Link, he was impressed by him being courageous, and he spared the little Link's life. 
and then he grew to regret it, of course, seven years later, when Link grew up and kicked his ass. So, like, Ganondorf has always been, like, you, you, you can see him respect other people, you can see him have human thoughts, you can see him have human nobility, like in Wind Waker. He's a cool villain, people love him. So to bring him back, and also I'm not talking about the Four Swords Adventures Ganondorf, because, I mean, let's face it, Four Swords Adventures lore is kind of weird, but anyway, to bring him back but it's a new Ganondorf, and then to give him absolutely no background or no backstory at all, like literally the first time we see him is right here. After the start of the game, of course, but this is, this is all the backstory we have. He's already mad. He already wants to take over Hyrule, but you might be, want, you might be thinking to yourself, oh, that's exactly what he's done in the previous games, right? Not necessarily. He wanted the Triforce in the previous games. He wanted the ultimate power in the previous games. He wanted the wish in the previous games. In this game, he just wants to take over Hyrule. Just because. Happens to see this Zonai secret stone on Raru's wrist just because. It's He has one moment of feigning depth to his character, and it's at the very end where he says, I must... Like, something like, I must destroy all my enemies, that is what a king must do. That's as deep as it gets with this Ganondorf. To say that that was a letdown, to say that it was a monumental letdown, to me, would be a massive understatement. Because he was one of the biggest pulls for the game when they revealed that he was going to be in this game, and he had this new design that was just so kick-ass looking. I mean, oh my god, right? But it's just nothing. It's just a big ol' nothing burger. And we can come up... That's the thing about, like, talking about the lore of this game, is we can come up with whatever backstories we want to as fans, but it's all so equally... It's all just fan fiction at this point. Like... The difference between fan fiction and a, and a theory, in my opinion, is that a theory should be at least marginally more believable. A theory should be actually, you could see that functioning that way. A fan fiction is just writing whatever the heck you want. Just writing whatever story you want. And, you know, it doesn't necessarily have to fit with anything. And I need to move on from Ganondorf because I, if I keep talking about the letdown and what they could have done with Ganondorf, we'll be here for forever. And I've already talked a long time and I still have quite a bit to get through. Another problem that I had with the story of this game was the fact that it did not really follow up on its continuity from Breath of the Wild. So the biggest, and I'm just gonna hit, I'm, I'm just gonna come out swinging with this point. The, one of the biggest things, right, differences between this game and Breath of the Wild is the lack of all the Sheikah technology. That's not the same tower from Breath of the Wild. The towers from Breath of the Wild, the Guardians from Breath of the Wild, the Sheikah Slate from Breath of the Wild is just gone. Just gone. And we had a lot of theories as to why that happened, but recently Fujibayashi, the director of both Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom, came out in an, in an interview, and really the interview's not new, but it was just released to the public uh, recently. Um, and I say recently, it was probably like a month or two ago at this point. But in that interview, he says, and you probably already know what I'm about to say, in that interview, he says that the Sheikah technology just up and disappeared, and nobody knows why. I don't even know how to go into that, to be honest with you. I Like, I don't even know how to go into why that is the most... Uh, like, I apologize, but I don't apologize. Why that is the most asinine explanation of all time. Like, what, the, the Sheikah technology just knew after the Calamity was defeated that its purpose was done, fulfilled, and so it just decided, okay, that's it. That's it, I'm going on vacation. I've done my duty. So I was just in a uh, podcast with uh, uh, Ratatosker and, my, and Monster Maze, who I'm a, a pretty good friend with, and uh, you should go check that out because if you're if you're down for complaining about Tears of the Kingdom, there's a lot more in that podcast. But in that podcast, we talked about this, and Monster Maze brought up the point that if the Sheikah technology was just waiting for Calamity Ganon to be defeated so its purpose could be fulfilled, then why did it do why did it not do that with the original Calamity Ganon that the Sheikah technology was built for ten thousand years ago? 
You see what I'm saying? Why now? It's almost because they, they just... Nintendo just knew kind of what they wanted to do. But they didn't know how to connect it to Breath of the Wild. So they didn't. They just didn't. And I mean, I could go into a lot more, but it, it, it just comes down to a whole bunch of things from Breath of the Wild just not fitting very well. Like, people don't act like they were just under the actual threat of extinction, like, what, four or five years ago, or however long it's been in between both games? They act like they don't even know that that happened. Like, do you not see the world still in ruins? Do you not know how that happened? Do you not want to ask how that happened? Like, what, what is going on? And then there are people who just don't remember Link. And I get it, some people, like random NPCs, if they don't remember Link, really, it's whatever. But I'm talking about the people that are a bit more important to the story. I'm talking about people like Hestu. You know Hestu. He's the big Korok dancer dude. How many times does Link go to talk to Hestu in Breath of the Wild? A lot. Or all of the Koroks for that matter. How many, how many interactions does Link have canonically with Koroks in Breath of the Wild? A lot. He even canonically goes and gets the Master Sword. Because he starts Tears of the Kingdom off with the Master Sword. So canonically, as of the canon events of this very game, he has entered the Lost Woods and he has met the Koroks and the Deku Tree and he has obtained the Master Sword. So why do they act like they're meeting him for the first time in this game? The first Korok that you go talk to is like, what, you can see me? Bruh, I just found 900 of you people. I drew this sword. I, I come to the Lost Woods every Tuesday for, for, for brisket Tuesdays. All right, and we, we share meat. It's a meat fest. Like, what, what do you mean you don't remember me? Do you see what I mean? That just doesn't make sense. It doesn't fit. And everybody had a whole bunch of expectations for, for Tears of the Kingdom's new story. We were all a bit tired. Like, it worked for Breath of the Wild the way that the story was all in the past. We didn't really accomplish much in the present game. All we really did was figure out what had happened in the past. Oh, come on, Link. You can do it. Get up the hill. But that's all, that's, but that worked for Breath of the Wild, but in Tears of the Kingdom, we were all ready for something new. We were ready for something that was going to be eye-opening, and something that we were going to be able to play through, rather than just kind of figure out that happened in the past. But they did the exact same thing in this game that they did in Breath of the Wild. Zelda gets removed from the scene immediately, goes in the past, and lives that whole time until the present, creating all of the different teardrops around the place and creating the story that we once again have to piece together because we don't get to play through it. It's a tired formula, but one that they copy and pasted because they could not deviate from the concept of Breath of the Wild that was a non-linear story. They wanted to accomplish another non-linear story that you could just do in whatever order you wanted. So to do that, once again, they sacrificed a story that you actually play through with your own two hands. And just like my ancient Breath of the Wild review that I don't even know if it's still on the channel, but just like that one, I, I questioned whether it was worth it. For the sake of good storytelling. Also, anybody who's watching this, you better not dare question my, my building prowess. This is the greatest vehicle you've ever seen and you know it. You can't climb stairs either, okay? Stop coming at my vehicle. I'm just kidding. I know you can climb stairs. Oh, where do you think you're going? You're not off the hook yet, buddy. We got bridges to cross and all sorts of things to complain about. And again, I could sit here and harp on the story over and over and over, but you get the point, right? You get the point. Can your vehicle do that? I didn't think so. Like I said, best damn vehicle in the world. <gasps> A bomb flower? You shouldn't have. I was running out. But you get what I'm saying about the story. I mean, it, it, nothing from Breath of the Wild was explained. Like, we still don't know who the, the three dragons are. We know that if you swallow a secret stone, you become a dragon that looks really, really similar. So, you know, who swallowed the secret stones to become those dragons, huh? Since the Zonai are so... And we still don't know who the hell the Zonai are. Where'd they come from? Are they aliens? Do they literally come from off-planet? And why did they take an interest in us? Why did they leave? But why did two of them stay behind? What? Why? 
Why, 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 why? Just so many things to wonder about. But, you know, since they're just so mysterious and all-knowing and all sorts of, you know, jargon, whatever, then who's to say that they weren't, like, the golden goddesses aren't Zonai themselves? And who's to say they didn't swallow their own secret stones and become those three dragons that are clearly named after them? Farosh, Nadra, Dinral. What if that's literally, you know, Faror, Nehru, and Din? Like, that's a ridiculous notion, of course, but is it? Is it really? The Zonai are clearly all-powerful, clearly choose their own sages, clearly can come up with secret stones that can give people powers, some people powers, that can shatter omnipotent rel relics like, you know, the Master Sword. Like, what? Where's the Triforce? Where, where is it? We didn't know where it was in Breath of the Wild. Some people were convinced that it was in Zelda since, you know, the symbol flashes on her hand, but I don't... I. People like me are not convinced with that. People like me need to know why it's just resting in her bloodline now, instead of literally being an, an attainable relic, like it's always been. It's only ever rested in people's bloodlines when it was separated. When it, when it needed protection, it would choose people as protectors, and they would be imbued with powers. Power going to Ganondorf, Wisdom going to Zelda, Courage going to Link. If it's all in Zelda's bloodline now, why? And, and what point is that? And shouldn't that mean that she's all-powerful now? Because the completed Triforce grants wishes. Ultimate wishes. And if it's not in Zelda, which I don't believe it is, where the heck is it? And of course, the biggest one, how do these games fit into the timeline? Do they even fit into the timeline? Is this a new continuity? If it is a new continuity, why do some Zora... Uh, writings reference Princess Ruto from Ocarina of Time. Why does creating a champion talk about Ocarina of Time's events as the distant past? Why do we literally see some of the temples from Skyward Sword spread around in Hyrule? And why is everything that's everything that's anything that is anything ever Zonai? As I was saying in my original rant video, it's like Nintendo was watching our videos about Oh my god, don't you dare, you, you know what, you know, no, nobody hurt my vehicle. Anyway, as I was saying, what was I saying? Where was I? Where, where, what am I even talking about? What, what is anything? Oh yeah, I was talking about the fact that everything is Zonai. The history of anything is Zonai. Hell, there are even flashback cutscenes on the Great Plateau where the Temple of Time like, there's a Zonai Temple of Time, which in and of itself is just so weird. But in the flashbacks, the Zonai Temple of Time was on the Great Plateau, where the current Temple of Time is. And if you don't believe me, I'm not going to edit it on the screen, or maybe I will if I feel like it. If you don't believe me, look it up. Like, figure it out for yourself. I'm not lying. The Zonai Temple of Time was where the current Temple of Time is. And the current Temple of Time, I guess, was built afterwards in the same spot by Hylians for some reason why I don't know I don't know everything is so hard to explain because nothing is nothing is explained and everything is Zonai which is just the dumbest explanation and the most easy one that you could ask for and I don't know a single person who's satisfied with that who actually cares about the story and what it leads to is everything being just so gosh darn uninteresting now Everything, nothing, like, nothing matters anymore. And it's sad. Don't you fall off. Don't you freaking. oh, you did. It's okay, I still love you. I still love you. But nothing really matters anymore, and you can, like, it might matter to a few of you watching this, but literally just look up, like, Google Trends, or look at... Look at the amount of, of lore videos being posted about this game, as opposed to before the game released. Like, it has completely killed the hype behind wanting to know what's going on in this universe. Because it doesn't matter anymore. Because everything is so convoluted, it's either way too complex to explain, or it's not explained at all, or both. Somehow both. It's a new concept that this game invented. I don't know, you guys. I feel like I've, I've sufficiently... What the... Epona? Epona? <laughs> I guess I had left Epona here from, uh, 
Who knows how long ago, but a hi, girl! Hey! Such a good girl just staying there, not moving a single inch from where I left you. I was always coming back for you. I swear I was. Don't you believe anything else? Don't you dare believe anything else. And see, now that now that I'm riding on top of a pona, I have to I have to change stuff around. Hold up, hold up. This is tradition. This is tradition. There we go. This is right. This is right. And if you don't see the value in this right here, then I don't know what to tell you. But anyway, I could go on and on and on and on, but I feel like I have, in, in this little ramble session, I say little, but it... it honestly, if you've made it this far, congratulations. You asked for this, so here it is. I think what I want to do is I want to talk about why this happened. Like, why why Tears of the Kingdom released and people got disappointed in it? Like, why, why, why was Tears of the Kingdom created this way? Well, to be honest with you, I think that... I think that the success of Breath of the Wild and the style of game that Breath of the Wild is has a lot to say about why Tears of the Kingdom came out as essentially a copy-paste version of that game. See, right after Skyward Sword released, if you remember, those of you who have been in the franchise, or in the fandom for that long, a lot of people hated Skyward Sword. And, you know, it's kind of, it's disappointing, of course, because Skyward Sword is a really good game. Story-wise. But gameplay-wise, it was a bit lacking. Not many people liked the mechanics with the motion controls, not many people liked the backtracking that you had to do to get through places or to go back to the same area to do the second dungeon in the same area. And when you were just trying to do that, to have like a segment where you're captured by the goblins and they take all of your stuff. Like, no, nobody, nobody liked that, right? Or the people who did are very, very few and far between. So Skyward Sword was, was complained about quite a bit. And Nintendo, if they've ever done anything, it's they listen to the fan base. Now, they might not always come up with very good corrections based off of what they read from the fan base, and sometimes they overcorrect. But if there's one thing they do, it's they, they listen to feedback. They've done that with all the previous Zelda games. Wind Waker was too cartoony. And so they went the complete polar opposite way with Twilight Princess and made the most dramatic, realistic looking Zelda to date. In fact, in the files for Wind Waker... Oh, is there like an army up here? I don't really want to fight an army. But anyway, in the files for Wind Waker, or for Twilight Princess, it's called Wind Waker 2. Like, seriously. And it has the Wind Waker object in there. So it was supposed to be a sequel to Wind Waker. But they listened to fans and thought, you know what? What they want is something more mature. So after Skyward Sword, the biggest complaint that they could hear was that Skyward Sword was too linear. Too trapped into going here at this point and going there at this point and whatever. So in Breath of the Wild, they completely released everybody. So that you can do exactly what you want to do when you want to do it. Doesn't matter when, doesn't matter where, go in whatever direction. The only thing you have to do in Breath of the Wild is complete the Great Plateau segment. After that, after you have your paraglider, who knows? The world, the world is your oyster. Crack it open. The biggest and most popular Zelda game to date, when you take into account the 3D release of it as well, or the 3DS release of it as well, is Ocarina of Time. B besides the, the Breath of the Wild and Onward. So before Breath of the Wild, it was Ocarina of Time, right? Zelda games had been living in Ocarina of Time's shadow ever since, and every game after that was an Ocarina of Time-like game. And then Breath of the Wild came out reinvented the wheel, and they were very much so rewarded for it. I think Ocarina of Time plateaued around 14 million sales across all versions. Breath of the Wild is above 30 million currently. So this non-linear break works, right? So Nintendo did exactly the same thing with Tears of the Kingdom. And they didn't want, and, and, and that led to all of the complaints that I've been talking about with the story and whatever. Personally, I don't see a problem with doing that necessarily, but I think that they could have handled it a lot better. I think they could have written a story that was more cohesive with Breath of the Wild. I think, I don't think it's that, some people act like it's so difficult to maintain a non-linear open world format 
and write a good story. Like, I I've literally read comments that are like, I don't know what you want from them, man. Like, I don't know what you want Nintendo to do. Like, do you want a good game or do you want a good story? You gotta choose. Why do I have to choose? Why? Is it that difficult? Is it that difficult to write a story that, that, that meshes with its own previous lore? News to me. And I disagree. I fundamentally disagree because if it was that difficult, then the fans wouldn't come up with such great fan theories. And fan stories. That are all significantly better than anything that happened in this game. And I think they should have taken a lot more care into characterizing the new characters that they came out with. Like, for instance, I, I don't care about the ancient sages, especially after those ridiculous, god-awful copy-and-paste cutscenes from- can- can you actually re-watch them here? No, I don't think you can. Those copy and paste cutscenes every time you finish a dungeon, you know what I'm talking about. I don't even know what to say about those, to be honest with you, because it's like, that's just ridiculous. Like, that is- that is just asinine. To release a game where multiple actors say the same lines about the same concept- Demon King, Secret Stone, Secret Stone, Demon King, Demon King, Secret Stone, literally. Literally. Asinine. Asinine. That- that is so far below Nintendo expectations that I- I'm- I'm very disappointed and I will probably never forgive them for that one. So clearly they should have spent more time crafting a good story rather than coming up with what they wanted to do with the gameplay first and then trying to fit a story in around that. They should have come up with the new story first and then tried to fit the gameplay around that. They were already going to get the sales. It's the sequel to Breath of the Wild. And speaking of new characters, I feel like they should have introduced more new characters. I don't think that bringing Ganondorf back was a good idea. I'll just be honest with you. I think that the series has been screaming for a new villain for a while. Like, why is it that Nintendo had to outsource the Breath of the Wild prequel game, Age of Calamity, which is non-canon of course, but Hyrule Warriors Age of Calamity, why did they have to outsource it to... Uh, who is it? Konami? I don't know who does the Hyrule Warriors games, but in order to get a new villain for the Zelda series, Astor. Like, the Nintendo team couldn't come up with a new villain? And you know what? Astor was pretty cool. He was characterized pretty cool. Actually, to be honest with you, the story of Age of Calamity is pretty cool. But again, it's it's essentially a fan story that people just wrote up. And because of that, it's non-canon. Because see, when you create new characters and you write new stories for these new characters, nobody has, no old weird fans like me have expectations for these characters. All of my disappointments in Ganondorf were because he's not as cool as the other versions of Ganondorf. But if it was a new character, why should I complain about that? I don't know to complain about that. You could create a new Bland character and I'd just be like, oh, okay, whatever. And it would be at the very worst, neutral. But now that you've brought Ganondorf back and made him Bland, now it's a negative. You see what I mean? Come up with new characters. Because then at the very, very worst, at the very least, they'll at least be uninteresting but not a negative. Anyway, I've, I feel like I've said my piece about this game. I, I, could, I could go on, I could write a script and follow a scripted review, but I just, I don't know. When it comes to reviewing games, I'm not a professional. I've not really done this that much in the past, so I felt like just turning the camera on and just talking to you guys, if that works. And if you're still watching this right now, you know what, just like with the Zelda rant video, I really am not expecting anybody to still be watching this. Oh, I don't have a bow, of course. But if you are still watching this right now, leave a comment saying, Shoot that Wizrobe. No, don't leave that comment. Say, say, nice shot. If you're still watching this, say, nice shot. Then I'll know. Then I'll know. But anyway, if you are, thank you for still watching. I, I just... After reading the feedback in a lot of the comments from my Zelda rant video, I just, I knew that I had to do something like this. And I had to just level with you guys about how I felt about this game. And kind of explain more about my thoughts behind my disappointment with Tears of the Kingdom. Look, a restless cricket. I wonder where I've seen that. Look, a, a Yiga soldier. Oh, look, he's dead. I wonder where I've seen these people from. Oh, look, a duplex bow. I wonder where I've seen that from before. You get the point. You get the point. So with that, you guys, I feel like I've said all I need to say. I feel like I don't need 
to go into this subject anymore. I feel like I have explained my thoughts behind the Zelda rant video. And just to reiterate and recap, I mean, you can still go watch that video if you want more of me rambling. I don't know why anybody would want that, but if you want more of me rambling, you can still go watch that video. But just to reiterate what I said there, I am, I'm probably not going to be covering Tears of the Kingdom exclusively anymore in videos at all. I'll still cover Zelda, don't get me wrong, but it'll be, you know, Legacy Zelda games. And of course, Tears of the Kingdom will probably come up in those videos, but this is not going to be a Tears of the Kingdom channel. It's not going to be a Breath of the Wild channel. This is going to be a gaming lore channel, like I've always wanted it to be. And it's going to incorporate other franchises, Zelda included. And speaking of which, let me know what other franchises you want to see covered. In case you missed it, there were a lot of people who asked for Metroid on the Zelda rant video. I did start off with a boss lore video for Metroid Prime. So check that out. I'm actually really proud of that one. Um... And that's it. I have here, the last thing that I have written on my uh, little outline over here is going forward, what would I like to see in the Zelda franchise? And that's something that actually, now that I'm thinking about it, I would like to ask you guys. I know I keep asking you to write comments, but listen, there's no shame in leaving multiple comments on my video, all right? I guarantee you I read them. Uh, but going forward, what would you like to see from the Zelda franchise? And of course, I will weigh on in on this as well. I would still like to see practically the same things that I talked about at the end of uh, Breath of the Wild. I would still like to see a return to dungeons, true dungeons, not these short little... <laughs> see, I haven't even gone into what I thought about the dungeons. Maybe what I need to do is just live stream and talk about this stuff, you guys. So, so maybe, I'll, maybe I'll live stream. If you guys like that... Add that in to your thoughts about the future of the Zelda franchise. If you would like for me to schedule a live stream where I talk about just... Maybe I'll just walk around in this game and talk to you guys about it. But anyway, I'd like to see a return to Dungeons. I'd like to see a return to at least a somewhat linear story. Like, if the story was like Skyrim... Like, if, if the open world was like a Bethesda game, where there is the main storyline that has to be progressed through with the main characters, like, and there are, but it's still open world, so, you know, you can progress as you want to, and there are side quests and whatever, I would prefer that we do that. Which is really what Zelda has been since the days of, like, Ocarina of Time, to be honest with you. Like, that's exactly what Ocarina of Time was. That's what Twilight Princess was. That's what Wind Waker was. That's what Zelda has been. Honestly, I want to see a return to that. Just in a world like this. And honestly, the world doesn't really have to be this big again. Like, they don't need to bust their butts making a world this big every single time or bigger. They could go to half this size, to be honest with you, and that would be more than enough. But I would like to see a return to... Oh... Oh, oh lord. Oh no, it's a big bad Hinox. Also, another thing that I don't get with this game is why... Why there are still regular level enemies everywhere. It makes it really hard to find good horns when there are still red level enemies, like, all over the place. You know what I mean? You know what I mean. Well, easy peasy, I didn't even get to see his health bar. But you see what I mean? This is like, this is the end of the game. And I'm still encountering enemies like this. That, to me, that's just, that's just, that shouldn't happen. That should have been a much harder level enemy. With a lot better loot, to be honest with you. But, whatever. I rest my case. So yeah, I'd like to see a return to dungeons. I'd like to see a return to the story. Or, to the kind of storytelling. I don't mind if they introduce new things. I don't mind if they introduce something else that can also break the Master Sword in the next game. Or if they introduce another blade entirely. I don't mind. So long as it's a good story. That's it. Okay, that's it you guys. I'm done with this subject. And just in time to finish my monster. That's to all of you for making it this far. Go enjoy some video games. Go enjoy Thanksgiving. Happy Thanksgiving. And uh, make sure you subscribe to the channel. Got a lot more gaming lore videos to come. I'll be reading your comments. 
to look at whatever franchises you guys want to see on the channel. And uh, yeah, we we this is not the end, you guys. This is just a new beginning. Okay, this is the start of something really really cool. Oh look, he's looking at his hand. I guess that's one other new thing they added to the game is a new idle animation. But anyway, this is the start of something that can be really really cool. All of us venturing off into new franchises together. So let's do it together. Anyway, happy Thanksgiving. This is Bandit. Looking forward to seeing you in the next one. And signing out. Peace.